My name is Gregory Gagarin, in Russian is Grigory Grigorievich Gagarin. I was born in Wiesbaden, Germany on the 22nd of February 1922. So I've got the distinction of having all twos in my birthday. My family, when I grew up, was very, we might say, broken up because uh, both my mother and father uh, ran, escaped from the Soviets, from communism, the Bolsheviks, I should say, uh, in different routes. Uh, my grandfather, on my mother's side, was the chief civil engineer on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. And uh, his name was General uh, Zurabov. And he, he was born in the Caucasus, so, so he was Georgian. For many years, or just before the revolution, they, their headquarters were in Irkutsk in Siberia. My mother went to school there, high school. She had an English nanny, and her, her mother was French. So she spoke quite fluently not only Russian, but English and French. That's about the time the revolution started. They make a long story short, my mother and her sister, her father and mother, uh, all got on the, my grandfather's private car, and they slowly, on the, in terms of inspecting the route from Yakuz to Vladivostok, they slowly made their way to Vladivostok. When they arrived there, uh, they were put under house arrest uh, by the local communist regime. And however, the two young ladies were able to move about. Both of them, speaking English, got a position at the British I wouldn't call it consulate, but there was, there was a British governmental entity in Vladivostok, and so they worked there. And then I go back to my father. He was a trained cavalry man in the Hussar, Hussar regiments of Russia. He fought, and when the front broke down in 1917, he was sent home. The local commissar of the township, uh, uh, Pskov, I think it is, Pskov or Pokhov, I get the two mixed up, uh, thought that he was a little bit too strong a man for, and um, had too much authority over the local peasants, so they decided to arrest him. The excuse for arresting him is that he had a gun. Well, an officer of the Russian army had a revolver. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, so he got arrested, sat in jail for three days, and then was walked to the cemetery for execution, he and two other uh, prisoners. On the way over, and of course he knew the town very well, uh, he came to the last crossroad before the cemetery, and the sergeant of the group leading him, there were six soldiers and the sergeant, um, was next to him. Well, he was still in good physical shape. Uh, that he was just barely 20-some years old. He just went and knocked that sergeant off his buttocks, so to speak, on his buttocks, and started running down that street zigzagging. Um, at the end of it was a wall, and he knew that, and he cleared that wall. The height of the wall increases every time I tell the story, so I won't go any further. And, um, it, however, he did catch a bullet in his right hand, which was an explosive bullet, and it exploded, so he never had use of three fingers of his right hand, and parts of the bullet ended up in his lower back, which eventually got taken out long after when he was in the States. From there, he went south and ended up in Yalta. By that time, his hand had pretty well healed. Well, I should say that on the way, 
he met a, a contingent of French troops still in Russia fighting the Germans. And he fought with them for a while, uh, heading up a machine gun squad. And, he, and the French thanked him and gave him a quite a gear for it. Then eventually he made it to uh, Yalta, or Sever Severstopol, got on board a ship, and then the ship's captain said, well, folks, uh, the crew has mutinied. If you want to go to Constantinople, as it was known then, can anybody help me with the ship? I can't sail it by myself, the steamship. So various people volunteered to do things. My father, the only thing he could do, knew anything about it, was to shovel coal. So he shoveled coal into the boilers for about two or three days until they got to Sevastopol, landed there. His pants were all shot because of the heat and so on. And he took a Turkish rug and put it around his waist and walked out to, off the ship. Luckily, at that time, his older brother, Serge, was at the still Russian consulate <clears throat> in Sevastopol. He uh, went and worked there for a few days with my uncle and decided that was not for him and decided to move on. Somehow he made his way to Malta in the Mediterranean. And um, there he joined the British. Uh, got to know some British people. And they said, oh, you speak English well. He says, we need an interpreter in Vladivostok. So they shipped him back on a ship back to Vladivostok from Malta. En route, the ship was hit by a typhoon. And he lashed himself to the mast. He didn't want to be down below when the ship sank. And uh, he said that was the scariest time of his life because he had no control over his life. And he just prayed to God that he would survive. Ship did not sink. He made it to Vladivostok, ended up in the same British consulate where my mother and her sister were working. That's where they met. Both families eventually made it to Europe uh, separately. My father and the British realized that his life was not very healthy in Vladivostok, so the British shipped them out separately, and then they took care of the Zuraba family, uh, and they booked them on an Italian ship going from Vladivostok to Trieste, and then from Trieste they took the train to Paris. Then they met in Paris, my father and mother met in Paris, and we were married in February of 1921. So this was 1917 to 1921 in about 17 minutes. <laughs>